Zelt Lux, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at EPFL Spring Lab. It's my pleasure to present Vote again, which is joint work with Inigo and Carmela. So, vote, coercion resistance is an important property in voting systems in general, as it ensures that voters can vote the way they want without fear of being forced by a coercer. Now, in traditional voting systems, this is achieved by letting voters vote in the privacy of a polling booth so that coercers cannot verify how courses vote. Now, clearly in the electronic voting setting, which is what we'll be focusing on in this talk, that is not the case. So vote again builds on top of the slightly less well-known re-voting paradigm where voters can vote multiple times and only the last vote counts. So here is how that actually helps with coercion resistance. So suppose a voter is forced to cast the vote under the influence of the coercer. Then in that case, the voter can do exactly what the coercer wants her to do. She doesn't need to lie. She casts the ballot as she would normally do. However, then at a later point in time when the coercer is absent, she can cast another ballot. And because in the re-voting system, only the last ballot is counted, coercion happens to be ineffective, thereby providing coercion resistance. Now, and the re-voting setting differs a little bit from the slightly more well-known approach of fake credentials. In the fake credential approach, during a pre-election phase, voters register with the voting system and then obtain both some form of real credential and some form of fake credential. Then whenever they're coerced, they will provide this fake credential to the coercer claiming that it's real. So they need to lie convincingly and they need a, a mechanism to either memorize or store these credentials so that they can use them later. Revoting and fake credentials both make strong assumptions in order to achieve coercion resistance. Both require some form of inalienable means of authentication to ensure that the coercer cannot interpret in impersonate them in the fake credential case during pre-election and in a re-voting case to make sure that the voter can always re-vote again at the end. So this could, for example, be a national identity card or something based on biometrics. Now also in both cases, the coercer needs to be absent at some point during the election phase so that voters actually have a chance to cast a real ballot. However, in re-voting, we need to make the slightly stronger assumption that the coercer is also absent at the end of the election phase, but we don't need to assume that the coercer is absent during the pre-election phase because there is none. Now, re-voting systems have a bit of a problem in that they scale very badly. In order to filter the ballots and to only retain the ballots that contain the last vote of every voter, Existing revoting schemes use a quadratic filtering complexity that compares every that privately compares every ballot with every other ballot. Now this is very slow and only scales to let's say large villages. Vote again, on the other hand, has a quasi-linear filtering phase that therefore scales to nation-scale elections. So let's look at an overview of voting at vote of vote again. Each time a voter wants to cast a ballot in vote again. The voter authenticates to a polling authority, obtains a voting token, and then uses this voting token to cast her ballot, which she then publishes on the public bulletin board. Now, by authenticating every time to the polling authority, vote again avoids to have a device binding to the voter that can then be taken away by the coercer. At the end of the election phase, the tally server takes all the ballots from the public bulletin board and filters them in order to output the filtered ballots, namely the latest ballots of every voter, together with the proof of correct filtering. Then we proceed, as in any other electronic voting system, by taking these filtered ballots, stuffing them in a mix and decrypt network that is run by a group of trustees to finally end up with the election result and the proof of correct decryption. So here is what a ballot looks like in a traditional voting scheme. It contains the encrypted candidate, a proof that this candidate that this ciphertext actually contains something useful, and the proof that the voter that produced this ballot is an eligible voter. Now, in order to filter ballots per voter, we need something extra in revoting schemes. We follow existing schemes and we add an encrypted voter identity so that we can group ballots per voter. And then, and this is a vote again specific addition, 
We also add an encrypted ballot counter that is increased for every ballot that a voter casts. And we use this ballot counter to identify the last ballot count by this voter. Now these two, val two values, the encrypted voter identity and the ballot counter are encrypted against the public key of the um, tally server and are authenticated by the voting token obtained by the polling authority. Now, of course, the encrypted candidate can only be decrypted by the group of trustees as a whole. So let's look at how a tally server might naively take a set of ballots, in this case four, by, by two voters that each cast two ballots, and filter them in order to select the last ballot for each voter. So all the tally server needs to do is shuffle them and then verifiably decrypt the voter identity and the counter. Now, identifying the last ballot per voter is very easy. All the tally server needs to do is group them per voter and point at the last ciphertext per voter. Now note that these voter identities are actually random, so these groups are not linked to specific voters. However, the group sizes are what breaks coercion resistance in this approach. Because a coercer can always force a voter to vote a specific number of times, and then at the end of this naive filtering phase, check if a group size appears with that number of votes, and therefore determine whether the voter voted again or not, and thereby determine whether the voter avoided coercion or not. So the key idea in vote again is that we can avoid this leakage due to group sizes by at the beginning of the filtering phase inserting a deterministic amount of dummy ballots so that at the end of the filtering phase, any possible groupings of votes among, of ballots among voters is explained by the groupings observed by the coercer. And this enables us to retain this good property of filtering in the clear without running the risk of breaking coercion resistance. So let's look at an example of how that would work. So suppose we have nine ballots that are produced by two voters and both of these values are public the ballots you can just see in the bulletin board and the number of voters will be revealed anyway at the end of the election. Now, these nine ballots can be grouped among these two voters in different ways that result in different groupings that, that would result in different groupings at the end of the filtering phase. Namely, these four possible groupings where we have one, two, three, four uh, ballots in each of the smallest groups. Now, what we need to do in order to make this dummy ballot trick work, and this is what makes vote against filtering phase coercion resistant, is we need to insert extra dummies so that we end up with a group, different groups that are a super cover of each of these four situations. Now, you might observe that the only group sizes that appear here are one, two, four, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, so that a possible super cover would be this one which indeed covers, for example, the example groupings of three and six. Now, the problem with this approach is that now we needed to add a ton of dummies in order to provide a sufficient cover. But we can do a little bit better by adding also, actually, we can do a lot better, by adding also dummy ballots to existing voting groups of real voters. So for example, here, we're in exactly the same situation as before, nine ballots and two, two voters that produce them. And again, we have four different groupings, but now we added, we padded up each of these groups to a power of two. As a result, the only occurring group sizes are one, two, three, or one, two, four, and eight, and none of these occurs more than once in each of these four situations. Therefore, we can do with a much smaller cover of one, two, four, and eight groups. And indeed, this situation would cover our example of three and six ballots. Namely, we add one dummy to the group of three and we add two dummies to the group of six. And then we add two more dummy voters, one with one dummy ballot and the other with two dummy ballots. Now at this point, you might be asking me, ah, this, this, these dummies, I, I see that, that, that works, that gives me, that ensures that these groups don't leak. But now as a result of these, can now a tally server influence the election result? Now, it turns out that that's actually not the case. In this talk so far, I've been omitting almost all zero-knowledge proofs that are in these protocols. There are a lot of them. I refer you to the paper to find them. 
But here is why these dummy ballots don't influence the election result. When there is a dummy voter, a voter that only casts dummy ballots, so not a real one, then the tally server proves that the final ciphertext that is selected does not influence the election result. Moreover, when there are dummy ballots that are added to a real voter, they're added in such a way that they can never replace a real ballot by this voter. So let's look at the security analysis as a whole. Indeed, for verifiability, we only need to trust the polling authority, which makes sense because the polling authority determines who gets to vote and none of the other parties. For ballot privacy, we only need to trust the trustees because they, in the end, are the ones that decrypt the encrypted candidates. So all of that is pretty good. Now, with respect to coercion resistance, we need to make slightly stronger assumptions. First of all, in order to prevent uh, voters from having to keep state, they need to authenticate every time for every ballot at the polling authority, and therefore the polling authority must be trusted with respect to coercion resistance. And additionally, we trust the tally server to enable fast filtering, and we also trust the bulletin board unless we use some kind of anonymous communication system. Now, the full definitions and proofs of this can be found in the paper. We also implemented all of these cryptographic schemes using a Python implementation, using the Petlib wrapper around OpenSSL, which implements all verifiable shuffles and zero knowledge proofs. And here on the right, you can see the single core performance showing that uh, filtering around 100,000 ballots takes seven minutes uh, on a single core. In contrast, Aachenbach's all approach takes five months to do the same. Now, of course, on a nation scale election, you would have a much more powerful machine. So as an example, we estimated that it only takes about an hour to filter 150 million ballots. The code of this is online. So just to wrap up, vote again provides coercion resistance by enabling revoting. It adds deterministic ballots to enable fast public filtering the security proofs and definitions are in the paper. Code is online. I'm happy to take any questions.